Good morning. I, I, I can't let this moment pass. It's just so sweet. I've been waiting for decades to turn the tables on teachers. How many of you are teachers? Now, what's wrong with the front of the room class? <laughs> Can we not join? Can we not participate? There's no one on the front row. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> that felt so good. Um, okay, good morning. My name is Kim Corley. I am with Shell. I am very proud to be here, and I thank you for uh, inviting me and letting me host this panel. Um, and it is indeed an esteemed panel. I don't know how many of you have participated in these kinds of discussions with panels, and there's always a moderator. How many? Everybody? Are we awake? How many people have? Four, five, ten? Okay. Almost all of you, I would venture to say, have have participated, and you always have a moderator that just blathers on and on and on, right? I'm going to, too. So I'll try to keep it really brief, really and truly. So I just have a very few quick points. I've spent my entire career in the energy business, and that's been a very long time. Um, I don't remember wooden pipelines, but I understand they did, they did happen. Uh, I, I have witnessed, though, in the decades that I've been in the energy business, an incredible importance of science, technology, engineering, and math. I, I, just sharing a statistic with you, I was thinking this morning about dry holes and the percentage of dry holes. When I came into the business um, a few decades ago, we were, we were drilling a lot of dry holes. Um, it, I wasn't in the business in 1949, but this was a quick st statistic that I grabbed. From 1949 to 2010, thanks to improved technology, uh, we have reduced the amount of dry holes in the upstream business from 34% to 11%. That's astounding, and, and we're seeing that in our energy prices and in the, in the energy boom that's happening in the United States today. How many of you have heard of hydrofracking? Oh, come on, y'all. Okay, so it's been around for 40 years. It's not a new technology, but certainly advances in that technology are responsible for the energy boom that we're experiencing today, and especially in natural gas. And that has driven natural gas prices down to a very, very low and sustainably low price. Um, and that in turn is driving huge investments in capital projects, unheard of in the last 15, 20 years. Um, and, that, and that's from LNG exports to gas-fired power to chemical projects. And I mean, it is huge and it is most significant here along the Gulf Coast of the United States. Uh, according to Market Wired, there's an industrial info resources group out in Sugarland, and they are tracking these capital projects and estimate that 209, really $210 billion in industrial construction projects are either underway or planned to kick off by 2013. And fully 80% of those projects are in the Gulf Coast of, of uh, the United States. They include power, chemical processing, and oil and gas production. And like I said, 80% of them, $171 billion in projects will be found here on the Gulf Coast, have either started or will start this year. So clearly we're on the precipice of this gigantic capital boom, but are we ready? Can we really handle it? Is that kind of growth sustainable? I don't know. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a few little statistics. I'm statistic driven this morning. Um, from a report of the Natural, National Science and Technology Council, uh, there are some 250 STEM education investments totaling $3.4 billion in the United States underway uh, that include, that are funded by 13 federal agencies. There's the Global Challenge Award, the project uh, the project Lead the Way, NASA Means Business, STEM Education Coalition, Educate to Innovate, and so on and so forth. But are we really making the project process that we, progress that we need to make? Um, I, 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 the percentage of high school seniors who meet college re readiness benchmarks in 2011, 52% in reading, 45% in math, only 30% in science. We rank 23rd in the world in science, 31st in the world in math, and yet we're the most powerful country on the planet. This is a real, I met a young woman named Taylor, I don't see her in here, but she's studying education at Texas A&M. And she told me that she got in just under the wire where you had to have now a, a major in the subject that you're gonna teach, or a certificate in the subject that you're gonna teach. I, I was struck by that because one of the statistics I looked up 
uh, was the percentage of students taught by teachers with no major or certification in the subjects that they're teaching. 30, 31% in math, 45% bio, biology, 61% in chemistry, 66% in physics, 79% in earth and space science. So I'm happy to hear that that, that that certification or that law has changed. It's gonna be probably more difficult, but I think meaningful and important to us as we move forward, cer certainly important to us in, inter in energy and industry. Um, I wanna spend t just a few seconds to talk about what I do now for Shell. I talked about capital projects for a reason. That's, I, I have been assigned the task of looking at construction, craft, labor for our projects, for the major capital projects that we're looking at. When we look at the largest risks to executing those projects, certainly it happens in operations where it's highly technical, but also in the construction field. 60-ish percent of our capital risk during construction is related to, ca to craft labor. Productivity, efficiency, safety, you name it. And we don't have enough craft laborers, craft professionals in welding, in electronics, in instrumentation, in heavy equipment. It just doesn't exist. Now, you're probably saying, well, what does that have to do with STEM education? A lot. When I talk to educators and trainers in technical colleges around the country, they tell me that the number one impediment besides recruiting people because we're all we're all focused on college bound we're all focused on two year associates degrees but the number one impediment once you get somebody in the door to train they don't have the math skills welding is a highly math driven geometry driven craft and folks don't have the fundamental skills that they need to be a welder they don't know how to read a ruler we can do better than that we have to do better than that so I'm excited today about the panel that we have here. My, my colleague, Michael Alvarez from Shell is with us. Joni Baird with Chevron, Doug Whipple with Dow. And Doug and I share this passion for construction craft development. Uh, Alan June from BASF and Heather Paul from NASA. So if you guys will welcome them and we'll get started with Michael first. <laughs> 